Well, hello everybody church. I'm Ray Waters and I'm coming to you from my den in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Stan is in Seattle and I'm in Atlanta. We thought it'd be really nice to just have a conversation about COVID-19, about kind of the place of the church, Christ, in the midst of what we're all going through. And, and I was blown away by the conversation. But we were using Zoom, and I know Zoom is like the hottest thing in the world right now. Everybody's on Zoom for all of their meetings. But we had some glitches that made it impossible to listen to. And so Neil said, let me take it. Let me see if I can clean it up. Let me see if I can put it back together in a way that maybe would be helpful. So that's what we're going to offer tonight. We want you to watch this. Again, I was blown away by the conversation. Stan says some incredibly profound things, and I think it's going to be very, very wonderful. One other thing that I just thought was funny, uh, Ethan and Rachel, they join us on this from Sharpsburg, Georgia, and they sing a song. And they sing the uh, Benny King song, Stand By Me. And uh, it was wonderful. It just kind of set the right tone, set the right mood. And then the next day they called me and they said, it hit us right after we sang that song that when you are having to socially distance yourself from everyone, probably singing Stand By Me was not, not the best song in the world. I thought it was hilarious. And they thought it was hilarious too. Anyway, we are glad that you are here for the conversation. And uh, let's move to it. Love you too very much. Love you guys. I love Stan. Stan, that was amazing, but I hated seeing my face through the whole song on the screen. That was an odd feeling to me. I don't know if it was to you. <laughs> it was very odd. I didn't know whether to sing along or, or, or what, but I, know I just my tried shoulders to started through. moving and I said, Don't dance, Ray. That <laughs> wouldn't be a good thing. Hey, it's good to see you, friend. How are you doing? I'm good. Just hold up in the opposite end of the country from you. I uh, know, and uh, I guess you're able to go out you go outside but you guys are really hunkered down you're really not getting out very much and just being real cautious even going to the store can you guys go to the store yep yep we can go to the store i mean it's pretty much what it is for everybody else in the country just trying to flatten the curve man thinking just, about all these things that we uh that we've developed now like flatten the curve and social uh, distancing 
It's I'm a different world, you. isn't it? Just before we came on, I saw that uh, the president has extended the uh, social distancing until the 30th of April. So the idea of anybody going back to church on Easter is uh, no longer on the table. Um, they've said federally April 30th at the earliest. And I think it may be a lot longer than that. I'm not sure. Do you have a sense for, uh, for how long this maybe is going to last? I mean, I, I, it feels like the best estimate right now is that April is going to be worse than March and May is going to be worse than April. June possibly is going to be the other side of the peak and feel like mm -hmm. April and July, maybe like March and maybe by August, September. But again, that's just listening to lots of experts. That's kind of the average of what they're saying. But I mean, the uncertainty is what gets you in all of this. We do like control, don't we? We do. We do. I want to have a date. And so I can kind of know what we're leading up to. And uh, we don't have that. No, we certainly don't. I enjoyed your message this morning. I think your message strikes at the heart of what all of us are looking for in the middle of this. Um, you know, I, I I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when, when I was there at the village on that Sunday morning that every sector of our world right now is having to respond to this, yeah. whether that's nation states, you know, governments educational systems, financial systems. I mean, what aspect of our world um, geographically and culturally is not involved? I mean, there are none. We're all, this is the most universal experience uh, in terms of uniting the world that I've ever experienced in my 52 years of life. I've never, I mean, outside of a world war, what have we had that would unify us in a common humanity like this? Right. right. I mean, this is, this is, you know, it's, this is ravaging refugee camps and infecting royals like Prince Charles. So there's, there's no exceptions in all of this. But I think the thing that I was wanting to really talk to you about today and maybe just kind of pick your brain and, and us share, because I think it's where a lot of folk are right now, is every sector of society, whether it's the financial institutions, the educational systems, the, you know, the healthcare systems, they're all having to respond to this and play a part. And we, and we play different parts, obviously. I was seeing Elton John is doing a, a house concert, maybe coming up tonight. You right. know, arts and entertainment folk are doing their part. But our part, yours and mine, and I, I don't think the religious sector is the only sector that speaks to this, but I think maybe we, this, is our, uh, this is our bailiwick and what we're supposed to be speaking to. And it's exactly what you talked about this morning is helping people if it's possible, helping people find some sense of meaning and then some sense of purpose. It took me a few days, I think, to really begin to grieve the things that I, I was losing and, and feeling people were losing. So do you feel like walking this comfort thing, helping people kind of deal with their grief? You think that's, that's legitimate for us, right? We should be helping people do that? Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of losses in this. I mean, not the least of which is the loss of life right now. Right. I was just hearing one of my favorite country stars, Joe Diffie. Uh, I was one years old. Did you, did you yeah. know Joe? Uh, uh, just in passing, uh, right. you know, we, we had moments together living in Nashville, but he was one of the good guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 61 yeah. years old. So, I mean, there's a lot of losses in this right now. I, I don't feel like you know, me being cordoned off and quarantined here, um, we were talking today, you know, we have a home, we have family, we, we have so much. I mean, dealing with this in a refugee camp on the border of Turkey and Syria. Oh my gosh. You know, when, when you're already suffering such deprivation, dealing with, you know, I, I've been, obviously I do a lot of work with LGBTQ folk and I've had more than a couple reach out to me and, and essentially what they're describing, you know, a lot of, a lot of, kids who are gay are living in evangelical homes with parents who don't accept them and so they're they're now in this double whammy of they're living in the closet in a quarantined house and listening to these lgbtq kids talk about the nuance and the difficulty the strain of being quarantined there um is, is you know remarkably difficult for them right now oh it sure is what are you what are you trying to share with them as far as comfort? What are you able to to say that's helpful, do you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's ex that's exactly the question I was going to ask you. And I think it's the question <laughs> all of us are asking one another. Yeah. And personally, you know, I, I think 
as, as spiritual guides, I, I don't know that we have answers, but we do have responses. And if I didn't have a response right now to this, if I didn't have some sense of conviction and leading, I think I would get out of this business, this world and do something else. But, right. you know, I, I, re I remember the different ways that I frame things like this through the years, difficulties, the vicissitudes, you know, they're called of life. Um, I remember there's been four or five ways that I frame things like this to find meaning through the years. I, I remember the the first and the simplest meaning for me was, um, you know, God was in a cosmic war with Satan and all of this was a part of the fallout of humanity and, you know, the earth as a zone getting caught in the crossfire of a cosmic war. And so... I remember finding great meaning in moments like this, thinking right. I was fighting the devil. You know, I right. was somehow a spiritual Jedi who was fighting the dark side. Right. Um, so that was a meaningful way to frame it. Eventually, that began to wear thin. Um, and, and you began kind of subconsciously finding, you know, different ways of seeing it. I remember when I, you know, I began reading John Piper and went yeah. from being a Wesleyan to being an extreme reform thinker. And I remember the measure of comfort for a while and thinking that God just micromanaged and dictated everything. Right. Um, you know, there wasn't just a sense of omnipresence and omnipotence and omniscience. God wasn't just everywhere, all knowing and all powerful, but God was also omnicausative. I don't right. know if you ever got into that, but oh, it, sure. it was a relief to say, until I thought through the implications of it, it was a relief to say, God causes everything. So that's the bottom line. So it must be okay. Right, right. The ones who are going to die are going to die. What can we do about it? Nothing. God must yeah, have well, I mean, what, what was your, I, you mentioned name it, claim it this morning. That wasn't your background. How did you frame <laughs> things like this through the years? No, you know, I think I come out of a background that would um, possibly not, not be as authentic. Uh, maybe kind of that we're going to get through this. God is on the throne. Everything's going to be okay. And I see a lot of that. A lot of, lot of people are, um, even to the point, we're still seeing churches that are gathering in large groups, which seems so crazy, just kind of, you know, we're, we're people, we believe God's going to take care of us. And what I've just been trying to say to people is, it's okay to be honest. It's okay to say that we are afraid. It's okay. This is real stuff. This is real stuff that we're going through. And uh, I, I don't have any of that kind of a a thought like I used to that uh, it was going to be on such a spiritual plane that I didn't have to uh, actually lock the doors and come into the house and listen to what scientists say. Now that's, it's a whole different thing than, than maybe how I would have done it 20 or 30 years ago. Well, if somebody asks you right now, where is God in all of this? What do you say? You know, I, I to me, um, God is very much a part of, of everybody's life. He's, he's with each of us. But these things happen, and the idea is not that God is going to change these things from happening, but that God has promised to walk with us through whatever the pain is, whatever the sorrow is, whatever the suffering is, kind of the wounded healer, kind of an idea that that's the God that we have. Uh, we're not going to have a God that we're just going to all have a big prayer meeting, and suddenly it's going to turn the virus away from America, and it's going to go somewhere else. We have a God that's going to be with us in our pain and sorrow and suffering, and he is going to give us strength to walk through whatever it is. And even if it kills us, God will never leave us. God will never forsake us, but will actually be holding us all the way through. And so that's, I don't know if that's simplistic, but that to me is the only way that I'm, I'm able to kind of place the God that I believe in, in all of this, that it's a God who wants to be with us in our sorrows and sufferings and uh, weakness. And when we don't know what we're doing, and uh, that's the God that I want to lean on and uh, trust in. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't have any sense that God causes these things anymore. No, I, mean, um, I, I, I'm also not a Christian deist that thinks that God is detached from all of it. I do have a sense that God is with us, that God is in the midst of it. Um, I don't, I don't have a sense that God causes any uh, of the bad stuff. I do have a sense that God redeems it. Right. I, I have, I do have a sense that nothing's wasted, uh, or to use Richard Rohr's line, everything belongs. Right. Somehow, 
somehow there is some sense of meaning. I think the farther and the deeper that I, I get into life and into these kinds of thought processes, the less I have any exact answer. I, I think about C.S. Lewis's book, Problem of Pain, and yes. then I think about his journey with, you know, Joy, his wife that he married right. in the 50s. I think about the movie Shadowlands with Deborah right. Winger and Anthony Hopkins. And in all of that, you know, Lewis, without without a ton of explanation, because there's always an end point to the logic, Lewis said pain is the megaphone right. through which God speaks to us that with the mighty blows of a divine chisel god is shaping us and framing us and it's through pain that god speaks and forms us into you know the image of christ to the fully human one and i, I think the question that begs for me in that at, at the conclusion of that statement okay god is making us better through pain my question is why? If right. if God wants to make us better, you know, I mean, the philosophical questions that hang out there are why why were we created incomplete in the beginning? Why did we need to get better? And if we do need to get better, why do we use pain to do that? I, you know, I have two children. I don't immediately go to shooting bullets at their feet. <laughs> right. Or, you know, I I don't I don't use pain as the megaphone to speak to them or to shape them. And I, I think one of the things that struck me a few years ago as I was thinking about this was Nick Walterstorff, the Noah Porter uh, a chair of philosophical theology at Yale Divinity School for years. And Walterstorff is one of my favorite theologians. But Walterstorff, you remember, lost his 25-year-old son in a mountain climbing accident, and he wrote a book very similar to Lewis's A Grief Observed, but his book was called Lament for a Son. Right. And it's just half page, one page soliloquies, where in the middle of the night, he's musing about the loss of his son. So all of this imminent theology from Walter Storff is being funneled through this very incarnational reality in his life. And I think he did his best theological work in this little diary called Lament for a Son. But Walter Storff said something that, that struck me and even though I can't complete meta metabolize it and digest it, it has a ring of essential truth to me. And that is, he said, as he was thinking about the pain that came from his son's death and trying to find some sense of sanity and meaning in the midst of it, he said he did have a sense that God was making him a more sensitive, caring person through right. those circumstances. He did have a sense that he was becoming a better more fully human person participant in life through those circumstances. But he said his ultimate sentiment was- I love that, I love that. So we don't have a God, as the writer of Hebrews said, who's not touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but in all points was sub subjected. You know, he didn't come to the world. She didn't come to the world in chain mail or rubber gloves or, or mask, God came and somehow the central nervous system of the divine, the creator was hooked to the central nervous system of a human and God suffered. And the writer of Hebrews said, so let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father on high. So he said, let's consider him who endured such hostility from sinners, lest we become weary and discouraged in our souls. So, you know, maybe Christianity's, maybe Christianity's not the way as we've assumed, but if Christianity is the way, I think one of the most essential things that Christianity is saying is that in the person of Jesus Christ, God did not come on a fact-finding mission. God came to reveal to us where God had always been, and that was in humanity, in creation, fully involved in the joy and fully involved in the suffering. Now, I don't know why life has to be this way, but I at least know that the creator of the universe and the person of Christ says, 
I didn't create all of this and then stay in an air conditioned office in the third heaven unscathed. Right. Right. I am in the midst of it. And if somehow he believes that there is an ultimate meaning and a goodness to this, then I can be comforted and look to him lest I become weary and discouraged in my soul. Right. So I, I don't know why we suffer, but even more than that, I don't know why God suffers, but it is the way. It is. That's profound what you're saying. And, uh, I, th I think that, that that has a ring of truth to me, uh, more so than any of the other thoughts that I've, I've had about the issue. I, I don't know. I don't believe God created suffering. Right. I me just either. think suffering is one of those antitheticals that if there's light, there has to be darkness. And suffering is the absence of joy. And I mean, I, I have helped create two children, and I was fully aware that their life would have pain and suffering and yet i did it anyway because i had a sense that the ultimate potential for good and joy would be worth whatever suffering and pain that they might endure and i 21 years into one of their lives and 14 years into the other i haven't redecided right that i still sense that with all the bumps and bruises and trips to the emergency room both physically and psychologically life is still worth living and the gift of life is to be embraced. And somehow the measure of the mountain is measured by the depth of the valley. And it's Walter Storff even said it, grief is existential testimony to the worth of that which is lost. So even grief, he said, he, he made the famous line, lament is love song. That's and true. our capacity to recognize deficit and pain is the flip side, the dark side of our ability to recognize beauty. And social distancing right now is not reminding us simply of how bad it is to be apart. It's reminding us of how beautiful it is to be together. And I, I think the first ball game or symphony I go to is going to be an experience to be savored. And I, I think I will be changed by this. I think, I, I, I hope I will be a better human out of this. You know, I was thinking about the 9-11 uh, when 9-11 happened, and I think we all kind of had hopes that that would do something dramatic in us, but it was so quick, and it seemed like we bounced back so fast, and it was, I don't know, I, I, that, that didn't do in my heart what I think this is doing in my heart. Maybe I'm just in a different place, but I really sense this is doing something. I read uh, Brian Zahn today say, oh, we're going to celebrate two Easter's we'll celebrate Easter in two weeks and then we're going to celebrate Easter that first Sunday that we all get together again it's going to be Easter again and hopefully it'll be Easter every time we get together maybe it'll be a beautiful thing and I do hope that these things will will really be entrenched and they'll stick in us and not so quickly fade away yeah yeah I I, I think it's I think if, if not then we wasted it yeah and I love what Jim McGuigan, uh, the old Church of Christ preacher, he wrote some great books, The God of the Tao. Um, gosh, I can't remember. Uh, oh, my. But anyway, Jim wrote several wonderful books. And I, I think it was Jim's grand, lost, he lost a grandchild at Luke. and Ray and I want to provide that as much as we can. So that's what I'm going to be giving myself full time to. And, and I want us to spread the word and build this. It's an important thing. This has been beautiful. I, I totally agree. I'm glad to be on board and I'm glad you are pastoring this thing. Our time is running out. I love your friend. We love everybody at Everybody Church. Thanks for watching. And uh, it'll be online. Check it out. Pass it on to some friends. Share it as often as you can. We'll talk to you next week. Love you guys. Daddy was a preacher, she was his wife Just trying to make the world a little better, you know, trying to fight People started talking, just to hear their own voice
people try to accuse my father said he made the wrong choice no one might be painful you know the time i'll always tell those people have a long since gone my father never fails even when the rain falls even when the flood starts rising even when the storm comes I am washed by the water Even when the rain falls Even when the flood starts rising Even when the storm comes I am washed by the water Even if the earth crumbles under my feet Even if the ones I love